Okay. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan. Uh, before we start, can I ask for you to turn off your telephones or put them on silent mode? Uh, I'm very happy to have uh, Haruka Sakamoto and Kenji Shibuya here to uh, talk about Japan's birth rate, which is a critical issue in Japan. Um, first of all, we'll have uh, Mr. Shibuya to say a few words, and then Sakamoto-san will uh, speak for a little longer to explain the situation. And why does the birth rate keep falling? Uh, we'll find out very soon. So uh, first, if uh, Shibuya-san can say a few words. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kenji Shibuya. I'm currently the research director at the Tokyo Foundation of Policy Research. And we have been working on different social issues, primarily focusing on the well-being of the people. And one of the research projects, which I am in church, is working on different type of issues related to social and health systems, one of which is obviously on the declining fertility rate. So now, as you know, the Kishida administration has announced a draft plan for unprecedented measures, unprecedented measures against declining birth rate. However, it remains uncertain whether this plan can effectively address critical situation of birth rates falling below 800,000 births per year with a record low fertility rate at 1.26, and whether they can transform society into one that ensures a comfortable living environment and guarantees a well-being for everyone. So uh, as commonly discussed, it is, is it due to changes in the value of young people, such as a decrease in romantic relationship or marriages, or the increase in social advancement and the higher education of women? So today, I'd like to, uh, I'd like to ask Hauka to focus on more on the data-driven discussion rather than uh, preconceptions or bias so that we can have a more productive dialogue to um, propose uh, effective policies. So I'll stop here, and the floor is yours. OK, thank you very much. Um, so uh, Sakamoto-san, please okay. go ahead. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you very much for giving me opportunity today. My name is Haruka Sakamoto. From the, uh, I'm a senior fellow at the Tokyo Foundation for Policy Research. Thank you very much for joining us today. So the ASTA birth rate continues to drop to record lows year after year. The Kishida administration has been gaining momentum in its effort to address the declining birth rate. On the other hand, in order to implement truly meaningful intervention, it is really important to clarify the cause of the declining birth rate and to address the underlying issues. So since 2018, our team have been conducting several research related to the declining birth rate. So based on those findings, I'd like to discuss why the birth rate has declined to such an extent in Japan. So why has Japan's birth rate declined so much? Whenever I talk about this kind of issues, I'm, I am always told the value of the younger generation have changed. Young people do not necessarily see love and romance and the marriage as a necessity in the midst of diversifying values, but rather than something bother and then hassle. Because of the diversification of entertainment, especially through the internet and SNS, people do not necessarily feel the need to fall in love. Or, as a misunderstandings are, the number of children is declining because women are becoming more highly educated and entering into the workforce, or the poorer they are, the more children they have. These are the, some of the things that I often said, but do you think are these are all true? Our research team has analyzed the data from the National Institute of Population and Social Security Research which is under the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare here in Japan, on young people's relationship, marriage, and then having children. And based on the GIS research findings, I'd like to show all of you how these sentences are all old-fashioned. First, the largest factor contributing to the declining birth rate in Japan is the increase in the number of unmarried people the percentage of unmarried people at age of 50 
was 2.6% for men and then 4.4% for women in 1998, while this figure increased to 23.4% for men and then 14% for women in 2015. On the right is the number of children born to married couples. In fact, the number of children born to a married couple has consistently remained around 2.0 since around 1970. Although gradual downward trend can be seen in recent years, the number of children born to a married couples has still maintained at a level of close to 2.0. Considering that almost all children in Japan are born to a married couple, it can be said that the largest factor behind the declining birth rate in Japan is the increase in the number of unmarried, unmarried people. Then let's take a look at who these growing number of unmarried people are. These figures are from another survey and show the percentage of men and women between the ages of 18 and, 18 and 39 who are unmarried and not in a relationship. In 1992, 40% of men and 27.4% 27 27 women were unmarried and not in a relationship. While in 2015, more than 50% of men and 40% of women are unmarried and not in a relationship. The graph on the right shows the percentage of each age group in the following categories. The first one, the dark blue is married, Light blue is never married, but in a relationship, including the cohabitation and the de facto marriage. And then light blue is a no partner, but interested in a relationship. And dark, dark green is no partner and no interest in a relationship. So the upper dark green indicates those who are not in a relationship and are not interested in dating, while about 20% of men in particular are not in a relationship and are not interested in a relationship. Also, on the previous slide, I mentioned that the number of unmarried people increased between 1980 and 2015. So what are the attributes of this increase in never married people? There are three possible explanations. The first one is an increase in having a relationship, including cohabitation or de facto marriage. Second one is an increase in no partner, but interest in the relationship. And the third one is no partner and no interest in the relationship. Our research indicates that the growing number of never married people are almost exclusively in the category of no partner and no interest in the relationship. So in Japan, it is often said that the number of people, some people are questioning the Japanese marriage system and then prefer to choosing de facto marriage or cohabitation instead of choosing the marriage, which may be the contributing to the declining birth rate. But in reality, the percentage of the cohabitation or de facto marriage has remained almost constant. Okay. Furthermore, we found that the majority of this growing number of people who are neither in a relationship nor interested in dating are men who are in unstable employment and have a low incomes. The table below here shows the percentage of biannual income and relationship status. The leftmost group, the married group, showed that 6% of the respondents have an annual income of less than 1 million yen while the 5.0% have an annual income of less, more than 8 million yen, indicating that those in the 3 to 5 million and 5 to 8 million are in the volume zone. But on the other hand, please see the uh, lightmost side. Nearly half of the respondents on the light who answer that they have no dating partner and have no interest in dating are those with annual income of less than 1 million yen. Also, only 0.8% of the respondents have an annual income of more than 8 million yen, indicating that those with an annual income between 0 to 3 million yen are in the volume zone, in the lightest side of categories. In other words, the number of unmarried people is increasing, 
and the majority of the increased number of unmarried people are those who have no dating partner and are not interested in dating. But we know that the majority of these people have annual income of less than 3 million yen. A similar trend is observed in terms of employment status, which the majority of those who have no dating partner and are not interested in dating being unemployed or in unstable employment situations. Employment status and income have also been found to be related to the experience of having heterosexual intercourse. This table shows the percentage of men and women who have never had a sexual intercourse with the opposite sex as of the 2015, with 12.7% of men and 11.9% of women in their early 30s, indicating that they have never had sex with the opposite sex in their lifetime. The percentage of respondents who have never had sex with the opposite sex is also clearly related to the employment status and income. In other words, the lower the income, the higher the percentage of men who have never had a sexual intercourse with the opposite sex. Compared to the full-time employees, the percentage of respondents who have never had a sexual intercourse with the opposite sex is also higher among unemployed and non-regular employees. At the outset, I mentioned that discourse that attributes Japan's declining birth rate to changes in the value of young people and diversification of entertainment is a misconception that is not based on the data. So if these discourse are indeed the cause of Japan's declining birth rate, then why do income and employment status make such a difference in heterosexual dating? marriage and sexual intercourse. In fact, most men with a certain level of income, college degrees, and full-time employment are married or have a partner. On the other hand, the majority of those who report having no besides sex partner and no interest in dating are those with lower income and unstable employment. Next, I'd like to look at the marriage market in Japan. Of particular interest is the bottom line, which shows the percentage of men and women who are married by annual income. The red indicates those who are married, yellow indicates those who are unmarried but intend to get married in their lifetime, and blue indicates those who are unmarried and have no intention of getting married. First, for men, you can see that the percentage of men in blue decreased, and the percentage of men in debt increased as their income increases, especially for the 25 to 39 age group in the middle, and, and, and the 40 to 49 age group on the right. Similarly, when we look at women, you can see a U-shape in the case of women. In other words, for women, the lower income group and the higher income group are married. The lower income group includes not only those who were housewives from the beginning of the marriage, but also those who left the workforce upon marriage or childbirth, and those who were on maternity leave and temporarily have no income. But in any case, women with higher income are now marriage more in Japan. So these questions ask respondents where they intend to get married in their lifetime since 1987. Despite various comments about diversification of entertainment among the younger generation, in reality, from 1987 to 2015, about 90% of both men and women consistently answered that they had the intention to get married in their lifetime. What we can see from this is that the problem lies on the side of the society which has failed to provide an environment in which people who are willing to get married but cannot do so for whatever reasons. However, according to the most recent 2021 survey, the lifetime intention to marry has dropped about, dropped by about 5% for both men and women. So it is important to note whether this figure is temporarily due to the COVID-19 or whether it will become a continuing trend. But in any case, are between 1987 to 2015, almost 90% of both men and women have an intention to get married, but in reality is that unmarried people have been increasing. 
Next, uh, these disparities in income and employment also affect the number of children. The percentage of child less childlessness increased from 14.3% for men and 11.6% for women in the age group born between 1943 and 1947 to 39.9% for men and then 27.6% for women in the age group born between 1971 and 1975. The figure on the right shows the percentage of respondents with zero, one, two, and three or more children by annual income category. The different colored vertical bars indicate the generation of bars. In other words, the leftmost black bar indicates the birth cohort between 1943 and 1947, and the rightmost white bar indicates the birth cohort between 1971 and 1975. First, on the left is the percentage of children with zero. So visually, we can see that the percentage of children with zero is the highest for the older generation in the group with annual income from zero to less than three million Japanese yen. On the other hand, bottom one is those whose annual income is over six million Japanese yen, and we can see that percentage of zero children is lower than that of the top two. It has long been said in Japan that the poorer you are, the more children you have. But in fact, the higher the annual income, the greater the percentage of people who have children, regardless of which era they were born in after 1943. So this trend also applies to the education, with the percentage of men with higher education having the more children. Okay. Next, I'd like to look at the women. The figure on the right shows the figure on the right shows the total fatality rate on the vertical axis and the age at which women were born on the horizontal axis. From 1943 to 1970, women with, with less than the college degree, indicated by the dotted line, had a higher birth rate than those with a college degree, indicated by the straight line. However, the most recent comparison for women born between 1971 and 1975 shows that straight line and dotted line overlap, which means we now already know that women's education does not correlate with the number of children in Japan anymore. In some countries, such as Sweden, we are beginning to see a reversal. In other words, research has shown that in Sweden, the percentage of highly educated women have children at age of 40 is higher than that of less educated women. So Japan is currently at the point where there is no longer any correlation between educational background and the presence or absence of children among women. And we will have to wait and see whether we will see a reversal phenomenon like in Sweden, in Japan, whether more highly educated women will have children in the future. However, when combined with the fact that women with higher incomes are getting married more in the marriage activity market, as mentioned earlier in my presentation slide, it is clear that women's higher education and social advancement are not the main factor behind the declining birth rate in Japan. So finally, I'd like to introduce the result of our recent study on the actual status of the sexual activity among the Japanese people conducted in 2022 after the COVID-19. The first a major problem with Japan's official statistics is that they do not include items related to the LGBTQ. The result of the research presented today also uses national statistics. But because Japanese official statistics assume that marriage, dating, and sexual intercourse are heterosexual, so the actual status of other sexual, orient other sexual orientation is unknown. So that's why our team conducted, including the not only limited to the heterosexual orientation, but include all the other sexual orientations. So the, uh, here is the result of the uh, sexual orientation in Japan. Of a particular interest is the high percentage of asexual, especially among the younger Japanese female, or younger female, which is significantly higher in Japan than in other European countries. So in other European countries, many previous studies have reported that asexual make up less than 1% of the total population, while in Japan it's about 10%. So sexual inactivity is a common trend, not only in Japan, but also in other high-income countries, 
but the figure for the sexual activity in Japan are higher than in other high-income countries. Although the fatality rate declined temporarily in all the other high-income countries after the COVID-19, the fatality rate in European countries showing the signs of recovery, while in Japan there are no signs of recovery. Unless we pay attention to the reality of the sexual inactivity and the deep social and economic factors, in social and economic factors involved in building relationship with the opposite sex and then other sexual orientation, the birth rate will not improve dramatically, no matter what countermeasures are taken to combat the declining birth rate. So in summary, the declining birth rate and the underlying increase in the number of unmarried people are not primarily due to the changes in the value of the younger generation, diversification of the entertainment, including the SNS, or more highly educated women. Rather, the real reason is that they were victim of the ice age or jobless age and the stagnation economy that followed and were unable to marry or have children if they wanted to. The younger generation should not be considered the cause of the declining birth rate, but rather the victim of the stagnant economy in the society. And it is necessary to change the social structure rather than attributing the cause of the declining birth rate to individual responsibilities. So it will also it is also be necessary again to make the policies based on the data who are the married in the country or in the community and who has the children and who does not have the children by using the data set. Only when policies are formulated based on the such data and analysis, the, any countermeasures for the declining birth rate will be effective. So uh, uh, thank you very much for coming today, and I'd like to conclude my presentation here, and I'd like to take any questions and comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions. Um, if you have a question uh, from the floor, please raise your hand, come to the microphone, State your name and affiliation, and keep your questions as short as possible. Um, first up, raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Okay. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. My name is Rick Weisberg. I'm not a journalist, I'm a scientist. Um, I, I, if I can just ask two quick questions. First one, do you see any indication that the leaders have any intention of switching to data-driven policy? And the second one is, um, your data is very fascinating, but associations don't necessarily indicate causation. So can you talk a little bit about um, how you draw conclusions about causes from your data? Thank you. Okay, uh, for the first question, unfortunately, I do not see any signs that government are trying to be beta based. Of course, some of the are, I mean, I do not blame the entire government officials on entire people in the government, but uh, for example, our research is the um, collaborative research from researchers from the several other countries. And then in Japan, it took eight months to get this data set from the ministries while the other countries, like the United States or Sweden or several other European countries, could take the data set within a few hours. This is the reality is that. So if the are, because the government has a bunch of data set, not only the healthcare, but in several other sectors, and if the government are really like to willing to utilize this data set, probably they can share the data set more quickly. But in reality, is that it takes quite a long time, which is a sign of government does not really, I mean, interest in data-based policies, <laughs> but uh, should be asked if you like to add something. No, no, nothing to add. <laughs> yes. And for the yes, second question, yes, of course it is true that correlation does not mean the causation. So the, uh, I think the only, uh, only our research and findings cannot conclude in any causation between the socioeconomic status and declining birth rate. But I think the, uh, there is a, uh, uh, even, but still, uh, it, I think it is important to advocate for the policy makers and politicians that our socioeconomic, socioeconomic factor may somehow correlate to the uh, declining birth rate and then further analysis is needed by using the more big data set. Yeah, I, I just want to add uh, uh, just one thing that 
when we started this work, uh, I looked at uh, historical literature on this issue in Japan. So I found some of the literature saying that there are major factors on declining fertility due to either marriage rate or the completed fertility, meaning average number of children per couple. But they have known, they knew that these are two major factors along with the socioeconomic status. But in 1990s, Japan was in a good shape because of, you know, uh, working age group was enough and the Japan's economy was okay. So most of the focus was more on these factors, which is still, which still applies today. Despite these, you know, knowledge, they continue to invest in child support rather than supporting um, you know, the environment for women to get married and also uh, have a confidence to have kids. So I think this kind of argument still applies today because they are, the current Japanese government focuses more on the child support rather than tackling on these critical factors, particularly on the uh, average number of children per couple. Okay, thank you. Hello, um, Ilgin Yorulmaz, uh, Turkish uh, BBC. Um, thank you for coming today and really interesting data there. Um, you mentioned that uh, there's a deeper reason why the birth rate is falling and the structure of the society perhaps has to change. Um, I also want to elaborate why are women not, especially on women, if, if I may ask, why are women not getting married? Uh, why is the society failing to provide an environment conducive to marriage? Um, also, um, there must be some truth in changing values, um, changing values towards society's idea of a family, maybe, uh, the tolerance towards LGBTQ, the work patterns are changing. Um, so if you can also elaborate on maybe some truth in the changing values. And finally, if I may ask also, the birth uh, control and IVF or the, their, or the lack of these things in Japan, do they have any influence on the birth rates, Paul? Thank you. Okay, oh, sorry, how about the second question? Second question. Oh, um, the changing values. Oh, uh, yeah, the changing values of society towards work, towards LGBTQ, oh, for example. Okay, so the first question is why um, not only men but women also not get married. So the, uh, compared to the men, there's a scarce data for the women. So the, uh, I can say the very limited findings here. Uh, but similar to the men, uh, so in the very old fashion idea is that highly educated women and high income women are less likely to get married and less having a children. But if we focus on the younger generation, like 20s or early 30s, the situation is totally opposite. So highly educated, higher income women has more likely to get married. So which means uh, in our research about the our, um, marriage market, not only men, not only women prefer to men with higher income, but men, also start to be preferred the women with a higher income and higher education. So in the Showa era, which is the 30 or 50 years ago, only men work outside of the home and the women stay at home and doing housekeeping issues and then child care. But if we look for the younger generation, 20s or early 30s, their, uh, their value of the marriage or their value of the I mean, home the value of the home is totally different, and both women and men work outside and share any house, housekeeping issues or child care work together between men and women. Uh, so uh, there is uh, some kind of mismatch between the men and women, uh, so uh, more women. So, but the fact is that highly educated and high income women are more likely to get married. And then the changes in the uh, social norm, especially for the LGBTQ. I said, in Japan, we do not have such data, I mean, official statistics. So uh, we cannot say anything about the, how LGBTQ issues affect the declining birth rate. But <laughs> we, I mean, our team uh, consistently encourage the government to include LGBTQ data so that way we can grab some more exact data on the actual marriage and then relationship status. 
And then third point, yes, so the uh, IBF and then the several other childbirth-related uh, child issues are covered by the national insurance or many big policy changes in the recent years. So, of course, these uh, policy changes should be evaluated in a timely manner. Uh, but as I think the IBF is covered, started to be covered in the public insurance just one or two years ago. So I think there's a no such official data yet available. But of course, it is very important to, sh important to assess if how to which degree those intervention can contribute to the increase of the birth rate. Okay, uh, next up. Nishimura with Hokkaido Shimbun. Thank you very much for the presentation. I think the, once the policymakers see those data, I think the, they have to think uh, something should be done for this, for this issue. But uh, we are seeing the slow, very slow progress in this in terms of policy. Um, actually, the, if we need some kind of uh, subsidies for the marriage couple with babies or unmarried couple with babies, uh, local government, uh, some local governments are very active to have a new, uh, such a policy. So, but the, what do, where do you think the difference comes from between the local government and national government? What, what the national government should do actually in the specific policy. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, I, I fully agree that the movement of the central government is very slow, and then I think the government already noticed that the fundamental cause of the declining birth rate is the socioeconomic issues. But for the government side, I think it is easy to subsidize money for the child care not to addressing, rather than addressing the root cause of the uh, declining birth rate. Uh, so, uh, but the difference between the local government and then the uh, central government, I think it's totally dependent on the capacity of the local government or urgency of the declining birth rate. Because the, actually I'm also from the Hokkaido and then I can, be, I can clearly understand the uh, severity of the declining birth rate in the Hokkaido area or rural part of Japan. And in those areas, the declining birth rate is uh, so serious. And then they are uh, without increasing the birth, birth rate or birth rate trend. I mean, the, any kind of the job market or economic growth cannot gain in these local areas. So I think the sense of urgency or seriousness among the, some local government. But I think the not all the local government are also active in the uh, declining bus rate. And then this is just my impression, but many of the local government are still focused on the um, issues for the other issues, such as the support for the older generations, rather than focusing on the declining bus rate. So I think it also depends on the capacity and the urgency of the local government. Yeah, I'd like to add uh, two things. It's a very good question and fundamental and the role of local and uh, national governments. But I, I'm not blaming the, the Kishida administration because he took this issue, put, he put on this on the agenda, although the way he handled it is a different issue. But uh, putting this on the agenda, and let the uh, general public understand uh, some sense of urgency in terms of declining working, uh, working uh, population. I think I, I, I admire him on that. However, I think when we talk about the fertility, for example, I think it is no. I don't think it's a, it is about uh, looking at a uh, single number because if you look at the municipality level fertility rate, the variation is huge. You know, uh, around one point something or less than one to up to three. So, um, you know, uh, rely on indicators specific to certain regions or communities. Uh, or a single number would be kind of misleading. So, for example, I recently went to Oki Island in Shimane. Uh, it's a very small island, but uh, its uh, you know, leader is very open and inviting young couple or entrepreneurs uh, to the island and even encouraging high school students to study in a high school there. So it's one way to invite next generation of people to stay there, start business, and raise kids. 
And it's a, a, another way to uh, enhance the, and change the social system and uh, uh, you know, the environment uh, which harness not just for fertility but also a well-being of the society. So um, that issue about national government will do everything which fits all is misreading because there should be a way at the local level. And I think after the COVID, and, um, I think at least general public understands that uh, relying on the national government would not uh, fix the problem. They have to do, and we have to do, from bottom up kind of approach to fix the things together. So in that sense, I think local, the role of local government would be uh, become more critical. And secondly, I was reading the blog of our sister foundation chairman, Yohei Sasagawa of Nippon Foundation yesterday. He rightly uh, stated that, uh, above all, the greatest factor is the deep sense of uncertainty about what kind of society awaits us in the face of declining birth rates where the future remains unclear. That applies not just uh, you know, young women and men, but also all of us. So I think that on that, I think the government, particularly leadership of this country, has a very strong responsibility. Can I sort of ask a question related to that, or if you like, the opposite of that? And that's, to me, the, one of the fundamental questions is the cost of having a child. Okay, now I had a child through IVF. It cost, I can't remember, three or four million yen. And when I had the child, the hospital presented me a bill of 725,000 yen. And that was outrageous, I thought. Whereas, you know, I'm from England, so we're used to getting stuff for free. Um, but people look at those figures and think, I'm not going to have a baby. Does that reflect in what you found? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you very much. So for the another research shows that there is the gap between the number of children the couple wish to have and then also the number of children the couple actually have. And there is an always discrepancy between the, uh, those ideal number and actual number. And the main reason why couple does not have the actual number of the baby, the main reason is always an economic reason. Yes. So the, uh, and also the, uh, having a children is uh, not a one-time event. But so just in the covering of the IVF, of course, covering the IVF or covering the delivery cost or covering the nursing care cost is, of course, important. But having a children is a not one time event for just a delivery, but it costs a lifelong event. So, like, the are uh, covering the are uh, not entire, I mean, entire period of the child care, but our uh, support not only for the delivery point, but also to support the higher age is also very important. And also more important is that I think they're very close to the sh Professor Shibuya's comment, but the young generation, young men and women, does not feel like uh, they can have the secure, secure funding for their children because of the uh, not increase in their income year by year, and then also the, they are afraid of the pension system in the future. So they are afraid of having a children, and then cannot feel like it is safe to have more children because of the economic reasons. Okay, and following up to that, of course, you have the cost of having the child in the first place, mm -hmm. then you have the, the cost of childcare. Mm -hmm. if, you want to, if you want to work, you have to pay to have someone look after your child in some places. And there's education fees for mm -hmm. high school, junior high school, uh, universities, um, and, and as you say, healthcare. Now, th these aren't new problems or new, new ideas, but the government doesn't seem to be doing anything. Um, so my question is, to what extent, so you just answered that question, I guess, that people think long term about how much a child will cost, but we've known this for ages, and so why hasn't anything changed? I, I am not from the government. I do not know the reason why the government has not done anything. But, uh, but I think the uh, important point we should note is that, I mean, support for the child care, including the financial support for child care, does not necessarily, does not necessarily increase the number of children 
among the couple. So the support for the child care and then also support for the increasing birth rate is a totally different thing. So there are some countries, some other high income countries, such as Nordic countries and South Korea, these countries provide a significant amount of money for the child care. But the reality is that the birth rate in the, those countries has been declining. So they're just providing money for the supporting the child care does not necessarily increase in the birth of the child, does not necessarily uh, increase the birth rate. So the, uh, of course, I do not say that all the support for the child care are not meaningless for the increasing the birth rate, but we need to be very careful for the, uh, what kind of countermeasures are important, especially are meaningful for the increasing the birth rate. Yeah. Any questions from the floor? Thank you. Um, again, just following up to that, uh, you mentioned Korea, and Korea has mm -hmm. the lowest uh, birth rate in the world. But also, curiously, so does Spain and Italy. Um, could you just broaden the, uh, the, uh, the data, if you like, about why would Spain and Italy, which are Catholic countries, and you expect them to have a high birth rate, have such a low birth rate? Is it the same reasons, or are they different reasons? Okay, I do not have a specific answer to the Spain and Italy, but the, among the, uh, I mean, the high-income country in general, the uh, root cause of the declining birth rate is almost the same. So the unstable employment, and then also the not increase in the annual income on the younger generation. So there are some Nordic countries in the United States or some other European countries, they are a more highly educated and high annual income couple, have more likely to get married and more likely to have a baby. This is the kind of the same among the older high-income countries. Okay. Any more questions from the floor? Okay, we've got an online question from Dennis Normile of Science Magazine. And this is a more general question. Is a declining birth rate really such a disaster? A shrinking population may lead to national economic decline, but if per capita GDP increases, individuals could still live comfortably. Uh, we talked about this earlier. Um, does Japan need more people, or can it exist with less people? Yeah, but, uh, you know, if we have shrinking working age group, the driver to may even maintain the current level of GDP would be extremely hard. So I'm not saying that the GDP is a you know, good indicator of well-being, obviously not. But at the same time, unless we have some driver for change, some driver for making the society sustainable, and in, in, not in the current uh, system, uh, just saying that oh, Japan should stick with, uh, dec and uh, happy with the current trend, and live, live with what we are, and you know, stay happy. But I don't think that will happen because e even with the kind of level of you know, working age group population, I don't think we can sustain the social system, social security, and the GDP, even you know, fixing roads. And I came here by taxi. If you take a ride on taxi, majority of the taxi driver is a very, very old man or a very young man or woman who, don't have, who doesn't have any experience in driving. So obviously, every day we feel that we don't have working people. So I'm not saying that you know, making babies will fix the problem. There's no quick fix. Even if the birth rate were to increase, it would take at least 15 years. So uh, not just this uh, on this married couple and inc uh, increasing fertility, but we need to think about more on the increasing the number of people. In the, you know, it's a controversial, but immigration or migration, and obviously we need to increase the productivity per capita, including automation and you know, more efficiency of the system. So I, I know Dennis is always provocative, you know, he's working on science, but I, I don't think the idea of Japan to stick with the declining population and be uh, happy with that, it's a, I don't think it's a, a happy uh, consequence. Any more questions here? Please.
Well, thank, thank you very much for your very interesting da data and explanations. My name is Yutaka Hokura, associate member of this club. Well, I would like to have your opinion about the past, why they got married and uh, they got many children. I would like to have your opinion about the past performances of our people. <laughs> Okay, so the, uh, okay, first I would like to echo one point that even in the past, uh, even in the past, I mean, more highly educated and high income, high income people are having more children. So the, even if we look at the, those who are already 70s and 80s, uh, if we focus on the, those age group, higher income people are more likely to have uh, children. So the tolling is the same in the past and also the current. But, but still, and they are uh, before the 30 to 40 years ago, uh, more people in the poor household income uh, tend to have more children. So um, I think they are, I mean, this is the uh, general phenomena that society has been changing. I mean, the, from the developing country, I mean, low and middle income come from the uh, changes from the low and middle income country to the high income countries. I think it is natural phenomena that the total fertility rate has been decreasing from the country's status is a low income country to the high income countries. So like the, uh, it is natural that the Japan has also the very high fertility rate and they are more than 70 or 80 years ago and they're naturally declining in the year by year, I mean, according to the Japan's economy growth. So the, uh, I think this is just because the uh, changes of the society, I mean, value of the society, uh, society and then the, yes, <laughs> but, yeah, so I'd like to add one thing. Around 1940, Japan's fertility rate was around four. You know, four. But Japan actually suppressed fertility after the war. In 1948, there was a eugenic protection law enacted, and the GHQ and Japanese government tried to suppress the fertility because you know, it's a speculation, but they want Japan not to fight war again so that the population can be controlled. So that really suppressed the fertility substantially. Since then, the fertility rate declined steadily. But a big reduction of fertility was after 1948. Okay, we have a question from uh, Richard Susilio of Tribune News Indonesia. Um, he says, you said the solution should be from the bottom. So in reality, what is the best practice to increase the population in a simple and easy to understand way? <laughs> I think there's no simple and an easy way. If there's such one, I think that every country or every community already does it. Uh, so I think there's a not simple way, but uh, yes, there's a no simple way. Give me an example. So fix a taxi problem. Introduce, introduce Uber or automated driving, for example. Can you, can you apply that to birth, uh, giving birth? You can extrapolate my you know, comment to generalize. <laughs> well, well, I have a question, a simple question. Uh, why has sexual activity declined or mm. appeared, appears to have declined, you know, sex and casual sex? Mm -hmm. uh, when I was young, it didn't seem to be that way. <laughs> Yes, so the, uh, again, sexual inactivity is a common phenomenon among the all the high-income countries, but Japan is the extraordinarily high uh, among the younger generation. But the previous, our research indicates that the sexual inactivity is not the common phenomenon for the old men and women. So if we look at the men, those who have the graduate uh, college degree, and then also annual income is more than 8 million Japanese yen, uh, they are not sexually inactive rather they are sexually active. And then the percentage of sexually inactive has been increasing among the lower income groups or unstable employment status. Uh, and then also we do a recent study about the use of the sex workers in Japan, and the same trend has, can be seen in the use of the sex workers. So the, uh, among the sec user of the sex workers, majority are the high income groups. And then the, um, if we look at the lower income groups, very few use the sex workers. So like the sexual inactivity is also related to the unstable employment and then also the uh, lower annual income, especially among the men. 
And maybe related to that, um, what has the influence of abortion and contraception been in terms of the birth rate? Um, I'm not, <laughs> I am not an OBGYN specialist, so the, uh, and then also the, uh, there's no such uh, detailed data set about abortion in Japan, I think. Uh, so the, uh, who, I mean, actually, f I mean, I think the, uh, only the age or some very limited information is available about abortion, where, where abortion happening and which age group abortion happening. But in terms of the socioeconomic status, uh, such as income and education, I think those data set are not widely available and they're not really sure. But I think the abortion rate has been decreasing in the recent years, I think. Yeah, previously Japan was a country of abortion, hidden abortion, uh, because of, as I said, eugenic protection law, under the law, but uh, it has been changed. So and the, uh, I think um, illegal abortion has been declined substantially, and even the, but still, the availability of contraceptives is um, kind of limited, mm -hmm. even though government is trying to, um, uh, you know, relax the restriction, but uh, still, the one of the fundamental rights of women is limited in terms of access to uh, contraceptives. Okay, Elgin. Hi, Elgin Yorlmaz again. Uh, I just want to ask about a, another social phenomena which is kind of like uh, known outside of Japan also um, as being something specific to Japan. The social recluses, hikikomori, Mm. 1.5 million people in this country are reported to be uh, hikikomori. Uh, they find social relationship difficult, and most of them give the reason as leaving their job, which is the start of this thing. I don't know if you have any data on this, but your comments on this, maybe, which is a very specific Japanese mm. phenomena. Thank you. Yes, okay. So, yeah, of course, the, I fully agree that hikikomori was social isolation. Uh, social isolation is a very important issue, not only younger generation, but also the older generation. Uh, and then the, our, uh, I think government already aware the importance of the social isolation. And then I think there are some, not the ministry, but some uh, position are started among the uh, Kishida cabinet. So the government already aware the importance of the social isolation. Uh, yes, so, but, um, and then of course the social isolation means there are no chance to uh, seeing the people outside and no chance to the getting someone to fall in love and someone to start in a deep relationship. And then of course the social isolation may somehow related to the declining birth rate. Uh, but also the, at the same time, I think the uh, detailed analysis is also needed. The who are the actually socially isolated, who are actually in the home and then not going outside at all. And then I think it is not the um, issue in the specific group. I mean, also the, this kind of issues or similar to the declining birth rate, but similarly, this kind of issue, social isolation is also discussed based on the uh, old fashioned misunderstandings, and then there is no such data available at this moment, but uh, it would be very important to analyze the data first, and then who are actually socially isolated, and it should not be think about any intervention just based on the, I mean, uh, misunderstanding and old fashioned concept. So Hikomori is highly correlated with mental and environmental factors. Which is also which are also correlated with socioeconomic status and employment status, so that is closely related to the issues which we are talking about today. And secondly, you know, like hikikomori, social care, you know what it is, is also similar to you know the issues which we are tackling. So we have a stereotyped view on these people, particularly young you know, social care boys. But when Haruka did a study it was actually more related to employment status or socioeconomic status or income or the uncertainty about the future rather than a changing characteristic or behavior. Greeny. Um, Kakuchi from University World News. 
Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about the research itself? I mean, how was it conducted? How many people you covered and how many responded? Any particular areas? And also you said that, it's, uh, that there should be more investment in women, mm -hmm. in, in, in the development of women. So a little bit more okay. on that. Thank you very much. Our majority of the research finding I showed today is a data set uh, conducted by the Ministry of Health. So the, um, under the Ministry of Health, there was the uh, National Institute related to the uh, uh, marriage and relationship of fertility issues and then the population issues. And then the, uh, that institute conducted a nationwide survey once in five years. And then this survey covers the uh, not entire population, but about, I'm sorry, I don't know, I forgot the exact number of the participant, but I think it was about uh, 20,000 for married couple and then 20,000 for unmarried couple. And then they choose the sample from entire Japan and then they are yeah, from the already 47 prefectures, including the small islands. And then we also calculate and then analyze, uh, try to be our data set is nationally representative not just for this specific part of Japan. So Shinke send you uh, literature, uh, yeah, published literature later. Okay, we have a couple of minutes left. Any more questions? Yeah, about the investment for women. Okay, oh, investment for women. Uh, the question is investment, how? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, society has been changing, or uh, uh, the, the kind of support uh -huh. that women would. Oh, yeah. yeah. So you are asking whether how you know the government should invest yeah. in uh, uh, women in terms of child care support to to increase uh, fertility rate. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Okay, yes. Uh, I think it's the partially yes and then partially no, because the uh, partially yes means that, as the repeatedly said, that uh, support for the child care does not necessarily increase the number of the birth rate. So the, uh, I think the top priority is the address for the fundamental goods, such as the socioeconomic issues related to the lower birth rate and unmarried couples. Uh, but as shown in the, uh, my slide, uh, yes. In, in this slide, I said that in the Sweden and some Nordic countries, they are already showing the reversal between the uh, relationship between the education and the number of children women have. So the, in the Sweden and some other country, highly educated, higher, uh, higher income women has more likely to have uh, children. And then I think this is because government invest, not government invest, but I think the society as a whole is more supportive for the women to having a children while keep uh, keep working. So the um, I think the uh, investing investment in the women is also contribute to some extent for the increase in the childbirth. Okay, thank you. No more questions. I have one final question, um, and it's about immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that the poorer countries in the world have the highest birth rates. Um, compared to Western countries in Japan. Uh, and yet a lot of the poorer people are going to the Western countries, and in those countries, a lot of them have higher birth rates. Uh, is that something you found in Japan at all, or has it been studied in Japan? And is it an answer to the population problem? I think the, uh, we, we have the data about number of children, those who are, I mean, foreigners, those who are living in Japan, but I think the, those data set are not fully analyzed yet. Yes, but I think the professor should be mentioned before, but I think we should need to discuss the, all the options, including the immigration and the migration. Okay. Yeah, I understand that you came from the UK and you have a real time experience about increasing the number of immigrants, right? So. Well, I've been working in, Korea, in Japan, so my contribution is one so far. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, yeah. I want to thank uh, Shibuya-san and Sakuraja-san very much for their very informative uh, um, presentation today. And uh, please come again. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, that was great.